lies a large reservoir with a dam that's used in the production of power. It's made by Ameren. Uh, we have Ameren, Illinois for gas in Missouri. They find that so strange that we get natural gas from the place which they get their power from. But in 2005, just years before I visited, tragedy struck. You may have remembered this, but the dam failed and an unfathomable amount of water poured down and cascaded down the mountain, destroying everything in its path and leaving many without access to power. The effects of the breach were still visible when I uh, pulled up into the visitor's parking lot, right, and as, the visitor center, as you could see all of the trees that had, had, had uh, you know, there's this big missing section of trees along its path. And as I prepared at the visitor center to take the hike up the mountain, I was given a map and instructions by the park ranger for where to run immediately if and when this warning sirens begin to sound again. Like they had installed warning sirens along the trail that if anybody's within the path, that if the dam were to have ever failed again, that they had warning sirens and they had a place for you to retreat to and find refuge. The trail also contained warnings and markers for where refuge could be found if such a breach would have to ever happen again. For in the event of another break, the water would destroy everything in its path, and to not heed the warnings would mean imminent death. In our portion of scripture this morning, Genesis chapter 6, <laughs> verses 13 through 22, the sirens are blaring. The sirens are going off. The warning is being issued. Mankind, as we observed last week, is fully engulfed in sin. We saw the full corruption of mankind last week. They are engaged in evil, and they are dedicated to depravity. Mankind has no thought of God. No desire to know Him. No desire to love and obey Him. They are totally depraved to the point that the Scripture described the condition of man as this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Due to the great wickedness, God is sorrowful over having even created mankind, the text says. And in our text today, God warns of a coming judgment. The siren is blaring. The siren, the warning siren, is going off. Will anybody hear and heed the warning? Yet there is hope, as the scripture says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 8. God will indeed spare Noah and his family to deliver a greater and true hope, the hope of a redeemer. Remember, Genesis is helping us through the descendants to find the line and the path to Jesus. It wants to make the line of Jesus very clear to us so that we can see the Savior, the one who would come to crush the head of the serpent. And so today, amidst the backdrop of great judgment, the destruction of man as a worldwide flood is coming, just as that water would cascade down from the dam breaching and all of the water cascading down and destroying everything in its path, the fountains of the deep and the clouds in the sky are about to open with rain for the first time to flood the earth, to destroy the wickedness of man. And so amidst the backdrop of great judgment, the destruction of man will observe Noah, described by Scripture as a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and having walked with God, it says about Noah. And we want to discover from his life four great truth applications concerning faith. Four great truth applications concerning faith. But Hebrews 11.7 says this, and we recognize that Noah is not a perfect man. We're going to see that Noah indeed sins. He is not the Savior, and yet God is going to use him. And yet he's classified in Scripture as righteous. It's by faith that Noah was 
perfectly righteous. But Hebrews 11.7 says this, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, the deliverance of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. His family was spared. He believed the warnings of God, and we're going to see this in the four great truths that we see in Noah's life that speak to his faith in the Lord, his trust in the Lord. Amidst a world that is about ready to be destroyed because of the coming judgment, because of the wickedness of mankind, the depravity of man. And so please open your ears to hear and listen by faith to God's word this morning. Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 through 22. It says, Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing, of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Well, beginning in verse 13, the first point that I want you to see is that faith believes God's promises concerning the judgment. Faith believes God's promise concerning the judgment. As we open with our portion of Scripture this morning, verse 13, we find that the Lord is abundantly clear concerning a coming judgment brought by God himself. It is upon mankind for the wickedness of man. And in verse 13, God is abundantly clear. He says, God said to Noah, the end of humanity has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of people, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Again, he reiterates this promise in verse 17. Now behold, I myself am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. The Lord is abundantly clear that he himself will bring about this judgment. You see, this judgment is rooted in the character of who God is. Perhaps we don't want to think of God in this way, that he would bring such judgment upon the earth. But everything that God does because of his character is good, right, and just. He is the standard for what is good, for what is right, and what is just. That is such a simple truth, and yet we often are uncomfortable with it. Because we would rather measure by our own standard of what is good, right, and just. Making accommodations for our own self. Justifying things that we ought not justify. 
But it settles a question that is often raised against God by non-believers. Does God have the right to judge? When we see this passage of Scripture and others like it, what should we conclude? Was God just having a bad day and just being harsh? Was God being unfair? Was he just not giving us enough slack? Absolutely not. For God is not obligated to mankind's terms. We like to put conditions around things. We, we are not, God is not obligated to meet those conditions that we set upon him. He is not to come to us on our terms, but we are to come to him on his terms. God does not owe man the right to live out a natural lifespan. We so often take for granted that we will live another day, and yet the next breath that you take is God's. We often hear the question raised, why does a good God send good people, right? Why does God send good people to hell? Why does he bring judgment against good people? And there's a wrong premise in that question. Because man is depraved. Man is evil. Man is sinful to the core. And so the question we ought to be asking is how... In the world, does God allow us to take the next breath that we take, given our sin? It's by grace that we live. And God does not owe us a natural lifespan. And that's, that's what we see here, is that God is getting ready to destroy all flesh, for the corruption of man was great. The wickedness was great upon the earth. So he brings judgment. Mankind was already by this point under the curse of sin. Genesis chapter 3, we saw the curse of sin, the weight of sin. And mankind is already under this point. There, mankind is going to die because of sin. For the wages of sin is death. Destruction was just a heartbeat away for them. And so God is God, and he has every right to take immediate action against sin. We then reflect upon our own lives and think how patient and gentle and kind God has been to us. For like a dam that holds back the water, God's patience and mercy and grace are holding back the judgment and the wrath that is to come for our sin. Thank goodness there is refuge in Jesus Christ. For that, for God will bring judgment. He is patient, he is gentle, and yet he will not tolerate sin. The dam will and judgment will come. And the warning sirens in this passage of go are going off. And even in our culture today, the warning sirens are going off saying, believe God's promises. Trust in Christ. For if you try to stand upon your own merit, you will be destroyed. Not because God is unjust, no, but because God is just. And he brings punishment for sin. We have no one to blame for our judgment and the wrath that, that we deserve other than ourselves. We've brought about destruction in our own lives. And God is a good, right, and faithful God. And he is bringing judgment, and yet he offers refuge. He offers refuge from the coming judgment. Not that that judgment wasn't satisfied and that wrath wasn't satisfied. It had to be satisfied, which is why he had to send the Savior. But faith, as we see in the life of Noah, believes God's promise concerning the judgment. God gives a warning, and Noah hears 
and believes and heeds the warning, doesn't he? By grace through faith. It says he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, a righteous man, walked with God, and so he hears God, he believes God, he trusts God. And so faith believes God's promise concerning the judgment. The siren is blaring, will anybody hear? Well, we see that in this passage of Scripture, and as we'll see in the weeks to come, that there was plenty of room on the ark. And Noah, as Peter identifies, was a preacher of righteousness. And so you can imagine, now in this time, rain had not fell upon the earth. And so there are those in the, the world that are saying, Noah, what are you talking about? What are you talking about that there's going to be a worldwide flood? As Noah, you can imagine, is preaching the good news that there's a way to be delivered from the coming judgment that's getting ready to come. There's plenty of room on the ark. Will you join me? But will they heed the warning? Will they place their trust in God? Well, it's evident of the wickedness of man as it's Noah and his family. Noah and his family are the only ones spared from this coming judgment. But second, I want you to see that faith trusts God's righteousness in the judgment. Faith trusts God's righteousness in the judgment. Verse 18 says, but I will establish my covenant with you. Notice God is taking the initiative to establish his covenant, his promises with Noah. And you shall enter the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And we see that they trust not in their own abilities, not in their own strength to weather, but they trust in the Lord who is bringing about deliverance through the ark. In many ways, the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ, who is the refuge from the storm, the wrath of God that is flooding the earth. We see a great picture in the ark. The ark is their deliverance. The ark is their salvation. Remember what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, no one had not yet seen rain or the fountains of the deep break open. And as the rain began to fall, we see Noah believed God's promise, even though he had not yet seen all of the outcomes yet. How often that's true of us. We want to see before we will believe. That is, again, man trying to coerce God on his own terms. But God is faithful to every promise he makes, and so we can believe God's promises. And we see that Noah then doesn't trust in his own self. He trusts the righteousness of God. He's trusting in the Lord to bring about this deliverance. As it says, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. It is the ark of salvation for his family, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. It's by faith that Noah believes and trusts God's promises. Trust the righteousness of God to satisfy so that he would be delivered from the wrath that is to come. On the basis of Noah, we also see, right? Noah becomes in, in some ways a picture of the Redeemer, Jesus, that his sons, his wife, and his daughters-in-law enter the ark with him. They are spared. We see in 2 Peter 2, 5, it says, And did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah. It's God who protected Noah on the ark. 
a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Again, there was plenty of room on the ark. If you've ever been to the Answers in Genesis, uh, they, the ark encounter that they set up, you will see, and you'll see in the displays there, that not only were there enough room for all of the animals and for Noah's family, but there was plenty of room for others. Those who would believe God's promise. But would anyone hear? Well, third, I want you to see that faith seeks God's refuge from the judgment. So it's trusting in the Lord and it seeks God's refuge, God's provision. It's God providing refuge from the judgment that he is bringing about. He says in verse 18, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds according to their kind, and of the animals. And he goes on and on and on, and it's showing God's provision as he's providing the refuge, the ark. There is no escape from God except God. God is bringing about the judgment, and no one will be spared, for they are wicked and sinful. Their corruption has been made known, and yet God is their refuge, their only hope of being spared. God is our refuge. God is our salvation. Isaiah 12, 2 says this, Behold, God is my salvation. Who is the one to deliver me from the wrath that is to come? It is God himself. And we see that it's the provision of God that is the refuge that we are to place our trust in, run into. It is God in Christ. It is the Redeemer who is the refuge from the storm. Behold, God is my salvation, Isaiah says. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. I love the stories of Peter throughout Scripture. And John records Peter getting it absolutely right a few different times. But in John chapter 6, verse 66 through 69, we see it says, As a result of this, many of his disciples left. The circumstances were such that many disciples who were following Jesus for physical provision of they were starving and they needed food and they had seen Jesus perform miracles of providing from the fish and the loaves. And yet Jesus had a greater priority for them, for them to walk with him, for them to trust him as Lord and Savior. And when they realized the cost of discipleship, many of his disciples left and would no longer walk with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to leave also, do you? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else is there to go? There's nowhere else where I can place my trust in which I can be redeemed and have a relationship with God. There's nowhere else to turn. For you have the words of eternal life. This is Peter recognizing Jesus' words that there is one way to God, and that is Jesus. There's no other way. No one can come to the Father except through Christ, and Peter understands this. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? There's nowhere else to turn. There's no refuge anywhere else. In the context of Noah, you could not climb to the highest mountain 
in order to find refuge. It was only God. Through the way that God had purposed at that time to deliver people from the waters of the flood, and that was the ark. The only way to be delivered was the ark. It was a picture of what was to come. The only way that you can be justified and have a right standing before God is in Christ. Where else are you turning? Are you turning somewhere else to try to find refuge from your sin? Trying to go about it your own way? Trying to find your own answers? Lord, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words to eternal life. And he continues and says, We have already believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's only you. It's only Jesus. And so faith seeks God's refuge or provision from the judgment. He is our refuge. He is the place in which we are able to be sheltered, washed clean, brought into the presence of God from the wrath that is to come to be spared. We see that in the time of Noah. Well, finally, we see that faith obeys God's commands in the judgment. Faith obeys God's command in the judgment. Look at all the instructions that God gives to Noah. Sometimes we think faith is just about an intellectual assent to something, knowledge about God, recognizing that it doesn't actually make its way into our actions, but true faith makes its way into our actions. And we obey God, not, not in order to gain salvation, not in order to, but obedience is very important. It's a, in, in fact, love and obedience are really one and the same thing. We look at obedience as drudgery. Obedience is a joy for the Christian. For those who have been regenerated by the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit are not some drudgery that we have to manufacture ourselves in the flesh. No, they are gifts of the Spirit that are brought to life, vivified into our lives. Look at all the instructions God gives to Noah. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with compartments. Look how specific it is. Cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be. The width of the ark shall be. I mean, all of these details. Put the door here, he says. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Right? That will be important later for repopulating the earth. Of the birds according to their kind and of the animals according to their kind. Of every crawling thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind will... Uh, come to you. So God is going to bring this about. He's going to make sure that it happens, but there's real instructions and commands that are given to Noah. He talks about taking food on the ark and preparing and being ready. And it's all summarized in verse 22. So Noah did these According to everything that God had commanded him, so he did. What a simple phrase to show the absolute obedience of Noah. Trusting in the promises of God, and that he, we can tell that he's trusting the promises of God because he's living it out. There's not a partial obedience, a half-hearted obedience of, well, I'll, I'll do some of the things, but I'll, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll kind of cut some corners here. No, Noah did these things according to everything that God had commanded him. Now, we recognize that Noah is indeed a sinful man. He's not perfect. We're going to see after the flood that Noah indeed sins. 
But in this way, he is picturing the one, the perfect one, the holy one of God who is to come. Who would obey God perfectly. In him we have life. And we see that faith results in surrendered obedience. In a loving obedience. To love and obey God. Faith results in real fruits. We see that it's the difference between believing in God and believing God. We see that in Abraham's life, Abraham's life, as he takes his son Isaac up on that mountain. There's a difference between believing in God and believing God. Because believing God is, I will trust you no matter what. I will trust you no matter the circumstance. I will obey will love you. Faith results in believing God. For it's one thing just to have an intellectual knowledge about God, but it's in the practice of our lives that we see what we truly indeed believe. When push comes to shove, our actions really demonstrate that what we claim to believe is actually true. We see that we saw that in 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 it says everyone